Hello and welcome to The Violin Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Mrugala, where I interview violinists from around the world. Please be sure to subscribe to The Violin Podcast uh, for future episodes. And uh, my guest today is Taiwanese-American violinist based in New York City and has been featured on WQXR, Belgian Radio Music 3, and was a semifinalist of the 2019 Queen Elizabeth International Violin Competition. Please let me welcome my friend, Max Tan. Max, thanks for joining me from New York today. Thank you for your invitation, and I'm so happy to be here with you. Of course, yeah. And um, as of right now, we're stuck at home. <laughs> um, as violinists, uh, we're stuck at home uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, virus pandemic, which I hope that we get to discuss uh, later on in the episode and how you're doing with that and share your thoughts on that. But but first off, let's get to know you a little bit. For the audience who doesn't know who you are, can you uh, just briefly talk about um, your life story and um, how you got started on the violin. Sure. Well, that is a very interesting um, origin story, I have to say. Well, I am uh, currently in my first year of doctoral studies at Juilliard. Um, I did my master's and my artist diploma studies at Juilliard as well. And before that, I studied uh, Harvard College for four years in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And actually, I think, Eric, that's where we met. Um, I was in the Boston Philharmonic Youth Orchestra, which is conducted by Ben Zander, and I think we were in that for a couple of seasons. Um, before that, I grew up in Connecticut, if you know of a small town called East Lyme. If you've heard of Lyme disease, that's you know that's how you spell it are, yeah that that's not so unrelated actually <laughs> um yeah so i grew up there i went through the public school system um i actually started music out on piano i wanted a piano when i was three i think actually i i was watching sesame street or barney and friends or something on pbs you know and they often have artists who come on their show and that's sort of how i got interested and I asked for piano lessons and eventually um, went through a program at the Hart School of Music. Uh, I studied with a piano teacher there by the name of Paul Rutman. And then I uh, went to Juilliard Pre-College for a year where I studied with a wonderful piano teacher named Victoria Mushkako, who is still teaching there. Um, and actually I was around nine at that time. And the whole violin piano switch happened around then. And the story I like to tell is that my parents who dropped me off at pre-college, which is an all day program on Saturdays, it sort of starts at nine in the morning um, on the Juilliard campus in New York. And it goes until maybe around six or 8 p.m., something like that. And my parents having nothing else to do sort of hung out with the other parents <clears throat> and they sort of developed this notion that, you know, because the, the violin is much smaller than the piano, um, must be more affordable. <laughs> I mean, in, We're, in addition little to, did in, they know. <laughs> yes, uh, biggest lie ever. <laughs> little uh, did but, they know, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the fact that you know the violin is so small, you can really carry it with you anywhere. More portable. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was something that seemed attractive to them: the concept that you can play in the orchestra. There are more chamber music opportunities. You can make more friends. Um, that was sort of how I was forced into starting violin. Uh, and I sort of came to like it. You know, I think as a nine, 10 year old, you don't, you know, love something super passionately. I think you just try to be good at what you're told to do. Yeah. And you know what? And, it w I, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. I think that when I was maybe close to nine or 10 years old, dare I say maybe even 11, where I started finally getting an interest towards becoming like a musician. You know, I think that's where thoughts come to mind where I'm like, okay, maybe I can be a musician. I am a musician. For me, that didn't really quite happen until um, maybe junior or senior year of high school. I sort of was in a pre-college program. I went to New England Conservatory actually for a couple of years. I studied with uh, violinist Lin Chang, who I think you know. I um, do know Lin Chang. So shout out yes. to Lin Chang, who is yeah, um, who I actually awesome. mentioned on another podcast, which is uh, the Everyday Musician podcast. I mentioned his name briefly. Uh, funny story that I he was my he was my chamber coach for a piano trio for a Clara Schumann piano trio. So that that was an interesting experience. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I worked with Lin Chang for a couple of years, 
Um, and then I um, applied to, well, there's a funny story behind this as well. I went to the Pullman Music Program for a couple of summers. I believe it was from 2007 to 2011. Uh, and the, the, you know, my parents have this, my parents are not musicians. And so they really had no idea what they were getting themselves into. They didn't know whether the time and energy and the money that they invested in these lessons, whether these were worthwhile investments. So, you know, they always wanted to test me in a certain way and see whether it was paying off, so to speak. Um, and so my dad actually submitted an application to the Perlman Music Program, PMP for short, uh, on my behalf and didn't tell me. And, oh, you know, I didn't asked, know that. Yeah, they didn't tell me. And um, so I think the requirements, you see, I never looked at the requirements, so I don't even know what they ask for. Oh. But I think they ask for like maybe three contrasting pieces or, you know, recording something like this. And um, so he took some competition videos or like recitals I had given before and he he burned them on DVDs and he didn't know that you could burn multi-tracks on <laughs> on a DVD disc so he, you know three short pieces he burned three separate DVD discs <laughs> and put them in sandwich bags and mailed them <laughs> off as part of the application uh, and you know the the results I think the application was due sometime in the fall the results came back in February and I remember I was in Boston for a lesson. And after my lesson, there was a blizzard outside and we were on our way home and we made a call home. And my mom said, you know, there's a piece of mail for you. There's a piece of mail from who? Like who would who would mail me? So I <laughs> know nobody. Um, and he's like, oh, it's from the Pullman Music Crowd. I have no idea what this is. My dad takes the phone. He asks if the envelope is thick or thin. <laughs> and he's like, oh, it's pretty thin. And he was like, oh, you, you didn't get in. <laughs> um, but when we got home, we opened the, opened the envelope and it was, you know, they accepted me to their program. And um, so I attended that summer uh, and it was one of the most transformative uh, summers of my life, I have to say. Um, and I don't think I would have chosen to become a musician if it were not for that summer so that that's pretty incredible i actually didn't know that you that your dad and or your parents they totally sent that application without you without your knowledge that's incredible i i find it rather hilarious because you know i think parents they they try to do everything to make you know their child's potential you know allow them to realize it and even if I didn't know about becoming a musician or you know this whole world of loving music and playing it with really close friends um, at least there was you know the sense that okay the door should be open even if it you know doesn't lead anywhere <laughs> uh, and so you know I think they tried really hard and I they're not musicians so they don't really know how the process of auditions work how these applications are reviewed um, but I think they just did what they thought was best and you know I wouldn't have become a musician if it were not for that experience and um, just to ask you applied or your parents applied on behalf of you for to, to, to the Paramount Music Program while you were in Boston, is that correct? Well, so I was commuting from Connecticut. So I live, uh, if you know where New London is, it's mm -hmm. on the coast of uh, Connecticut, close to Rhode Island. Um, so it's only about an hour and a half, maybe two hour tops drive to Boston. Um, so we were commuting, you know, for lessons on the weekends uh, every Saturday. They also have a preparatory division like Juilliard and it's a college program with theory and ear training and all of that good stuff so you apply for this program uh pre-college for yeah. the Perlman music program okay i understand so then you decided to go to harvard for a non-music major you minored in you minored in music but you didn't major in music so yes. describe <laughs> to the audience what was going on uh in the decision making process when you decided you know what maybe i'll keep music as a minor just to you know make sure i'm 
make sure I'm doing this, but you describe, describe the process on how you got into Harvard and what you studied at Harvard. So my major at Harvard was something called um, human developmental and regenerative biology. Um, and that sounds something really complicated and fancy for stem cell biology, which is sort of the more colloquial name of the department. Um, it was a very interesting process applying to schools because I, I mean, I hate to feel the stereotype of Asian Americans who are academically ambitious, but um, it was not in my parents' view um, my future to go into music school. That was not their view at all. And they thought that, you know, taking music lessons was something that gave me a lot of joy and um, inspiration. Um, it made me work really, really hard, but they really didn't see it as a career path. And so um, after applying for schools, there was a moment of frustration because I was pretty convinced that I was going to go to a conservatory. I applplied to um, New England Conservatory and Juilliard and uh, was pretty set on going to one or the other. Um, but you know, I submitted applications to universities just in case and um, and I didn't declare major actually. The, the, there were several things that happened that eventually convinced me to go. For the first was, um, of course, my parents. <laughs> it's a pretty powerful influence. Um, also, at the time I was studying with Itzhak Perlman and Catherine Cho, um, both who were teaching at the pre-college in Juilliard. <clears throat> and um, the Perlman Music Program, of course, Itzhak Perlman teaches there, but it's really the, the real brainchild behind that program is his wife, Toby Perlman. Uh, and she is this wonderful motherly mentor. <laughs> um, she sat me down. I, I often go to her for advice and she sat me down. I remember we had talk about colleges and she said, the first thing she said, I remember was like, don't be an idiot. Um, Clearly, yeah. Have, like that, that's the worst thing you, you do. Like, you know, especially if you're making <laughs> such a huge decision that will set right. you up for the rest of your life. Like, don't be an idiot. I think that's yeah. wise advice. <laughs> well, I think in all aspects, not just about colleges, but um, but she also jokingly said, you know, we're not going to take you back if you decide to come to Juilliard. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I think it was a joke. I hope it was a joke. But you know, I she she had a lot to say about. Um, you know, not every musician has the same path. And I think when you decide to, you know, to pursue what interests you, um, it's impossible that you have every possible musician going through the same education and coming out exactly the same. It's, it's just, I, I don't think it's the kind of world we want to live in. I don't think it's the goal of the arts. Um, and it was really interesting that she talk to me about growing as not just a you know a technically proficient performer but also as an emotionally mature person um, mm -hmm. and that to me was really uh, I didn't understand it at the time actually and once I'd gone through college um, a lot of people asked me if I regretted not going to music school and I don't regret it at all I think if any musician has the opportunity to go to university I really think they should take it um, and study something outside of music, which we live, breathe all the time. Um, it, because, you know, there's more than one dimension to this world we live in, you know, society, the global community, everything we do, you know, has some kind of influence on someone else. And I think understanding the world from a different place is equally as important as, you know, being able to play in tune. Um, or count a complex rhythm. I, this sounds very basic, but um, that that was something uh, that was in, sort of told to me at that time, but I didn't really understand until I got through college. Yeah, I oftentimes think what my life would have been like if I attended university instead of a conservatory. And I, you know, I attended the Boston Conservatory and sometimes I did feel that I was in this bubble where I wanted to be around people outside of my major, outside of music. And I think that what you said was really, really valuable for someone who's listening to this podcast, who 
is considering these options as we speak right now, because a lot of musicians took auditions just this uh, past season, and they're trying to decide on a school. So maybe this could be the violin uh, advice that they need. So thank you for sharing all of that. And you are currently a student at the Juilliard School. So describe that conversation with your parents when you were like, okay, I graduated Harvard, but I want to attend conservatory. How was that like? Um, well, it was, it's a continuing discussion. Mm. Uh, it sort of started out as when I was thinking of applying to grad schools, you should decide um, sort of what you want to pursue as your study. And for them, you know, the choice was clear, medical school. And I, <laughs> I actually, you know, studied for the MCATs, which are the, the sort of SATs, but, you know, in preparation for applying to medical school. Um, I was working in a research lab all throughout um, the last two years, two and a half years of my undergrad. Um, and I was working on a very interesting research project, which was at a lab run by a scientist named Richard Lee. I think he's also a physician. Um, and, you know, I really got to see so many different aspects about medicine as a science. Um, and at that time, Lin Cheng's wife, Lisa Wong, uh, who's also a wonderful uh, doctor and um, also violist, uh, advocate for the arts, um, she was uh, running a program at the Harvard Art Museums, which was sort of bridging music and medicine together. And at that time, you know, I, I have to say, I am not the most gifted at science. I am not a gifted researcher. I am definitely not. Um, I, I didn't see myself becoming, you know, a, a, a well, comf you know, I, I wouldn't have been comfortable in a career as a doctor, I don't think. Um, but at that time, I think seeing the connections between the arts and the sciences made me realize that, you know, I shouldn't give up music entirely because there is a lot of joy and interest there that I still had um, and seeing how the arts could be involved in a lot of different areas, you know, these intersections um, was particularly interesting. And I, I was sort of um, told this in freshman year, that I, if anyone who's watching this has visited the Harvard campus, there's a specific gate. Uh, that is sort of by tradition students are supposed to walk through. Like you walk into the yard um, when you move into campus and then you walk out of it uh, when you graduate. And so on the way in, I think it says something like enter to grow in wisdom. And then on the other side, so when you walk out, the quote says, um, and depart to better serve thy country and thy kind. Um, and this sort of like this feeling that you everyone matters and everyone has something to contribute um and i don't think you know i have so many friends who are gifted doctors in training now um who are in medical school they're going to the residencies they're graduating um they're becoming surgeons and um, physicians and nurses and um, researchers it was just really exciting but i could never you know see myself I, competing is not really the right word but i couldn't reach the same kind of potential that they have. Whereas in the arts, having seen both sides, I think it was something quite different. And I saw myself, you know, I didn't, I don't know what it is yet. And I still don't know. But I think I have an interesting perspective on that particular intersection. And I should go for it. <laughs> um, thank, I yeah, haven't thank you for, yet, but <laughs> And thank you for sharing all of that. I think that what you said was, um, quite inspiring for me. I didn't know that. I mean, I've been to Harvard Yard many times and I actually didn't know about those quotes coming going in and going out. And I think you brought up an interesting connection with the arts and medicine because like medicine, music can also heal. I think that's also a very important aspect. And I think that's part of the reason why I'm in music as well, because um, I definitely did not choose a traditional career path in music. I thought back when I was in conservatory, I was going to be an orchestral musician. And my story was I I went for an audition, orchestra audition with Utah Symphony uh, right before my senior year, or I think it was like in the beginning of my senior year of undergrad. And I, you know, I flew out 
I got like the cheapest plane ticket out to you know Utah, and I was like, okay, well, I'm here. I'm going to do this audition and see where it takes me. I hear that it takes ten years for people to finally get comfortable taking violin auditions. I go, might as well just start now. So I took that audition. You know, like it was it was a very surreal experience because you were walking out on the carpet. And you, you know, you couldn't hear like the the heels of your feet. You know, everything was quiet. I played a ten minute audition. I totally bombed Brahms Violin Concerto. I'm sorry that that I I've butchered it, but it was on the plane ride back where I was like, you know what? Maybe this isn't for me. Not the fact because I failed, but the fact that I'm like, do I really see myself in an orchestra and? I think every artist has that conversation with themselves, music or non-music, where you're like, "Is this the right thing for me? Is this the traditional career path?" And what you said was, you know, I think every musician struggles with this: is to find a career path that, you know, that might be best suited for you, but not someone else. Right. I think one of the challenges in our industry is that、um, I, I, I. I find it very difficult to think of another profession in which the people have such difficulty affording the tools of their trade. Yes, I I can't. I mean, not that I know of many other professions, but I think actually in music it's quite unique, and maybe for the arts in general, it's very hard to afford the tools of our craft. If you think about the value of instruments. Who owns a you know antique instrument nowadays? Most of the performers are being、uh, loaned instruments by、right. foundations, by very generous philanthropists, donors, collectors, and by museums. You know these kinds of institutions.、Um, and then on top of that, you have to pay the insurance for the instrument. Most of、uh, performers probably regularly have to maintain that instrument. We have to buy strings for the violin. We have to do that maybe once a month if we, you know, play really, really regularly. Even especially last time, maybe every two weeks. <laughs> right. If、some. you if you do perform on a regular basis, I think yeah, you, musicians, artists change strings, maybe once a month. Yeah, and I think you know well. In light of the pandemic, we don't really get to do this, but oftentimes we also have to rehair our bows every month,、um, which is also a regular. Can、expense. we talk about that for a second? My <laughs> bow hair is awful, <laughs> and I'm sure everybody、yeah. listening is like, "Ugh, I just why can't bow rehairs be an essential business?" <laughs> you know, well, you at know, least for artists, right? So I'm like, luckily, I think I'm fine with my bow hairs, but I don't know what that says about my. Playing. <laughs> I think the last time I reheard my bow was in December. Uh, uh, yeah, and I don't think I've reheard it since. But it's it's still fine. I just put some rosin on. I just clean the strings, and it kind of works still. <laughs> and, and yeah, and hope it still makes a sound. You know. So Max, we met in Boston, like as you said earlier, and we met through the Boston Philharmonic Youth Orchestra. And I remember when I was there, I was. Uh, sitting in the first violin section, and you were playing、uh, Barber Concerto. Is that right? Oh、uh, yes, that was a very memorable experience. <laughs> that was well, yeah, cer- certainly it was for me. I'd love to hear your take on that.、Um, I was just so impressed with your ability to play the violin when I was sitting in the in the orchestra section because you had such musicality. You. Yeah, you had、um, such virtuosity. Uh, whatever that means, everybody has a different interpretation on virtuosity. But、uh, to me, you were a virtuosic player for、uh, the Barber Violin Concerto, and I wanted to, you know, talk about your experience on stage when you're performing in front of an orchestra, and how do you?、Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um. Well, I think it's. I think it's both daunting, and comforting.、Um, Because you're surrounded by colleagues, I think there's a very different kind of experience when you play with an orchestra versus when you give a solo recital. You know, maybe with a collaborative pianist,、uh, maybe in chamber music. But I, I think there's something about you know an orchestra that has at least seventy, eighty people, and it's it was especially great with、um, with that youth orchestra that I knew everyone on stage. We were all friends and colleagues and. Um, and that we hung out and really got to know each other, that was really comforting. And 
I will just put it out there. I get stage fright. Like, there's no tomorrow. I, I often, get, the hardest part is actually getting out from backstage to where I'm supposed to stand. And then maybe for the first couple of minutes, I will be shaking or I will find it very hard to stay connected. Um, mind, spirit, earth, you know, feeling that um, alignment. And after a while, I think the music becomes such a source of power that you can't help but just really try to speak it and try to do it as much justice you know, for the composer, for the work itself, and for the listeners who are so kind to, you know, give up an hour or two to go to a concert and listen to you play. Um, and so that was a really interesting experience because I remember I had just come from um, the menu and competition. I was, so I, I, I believe it was my junior year of college. I do um, remember this. Yeah, I remember that you were a participant in menu and right. Yeah, and... Um, I had the the story behind that was I applied to a very small regional local competition um, with the Barber Concerto, and I think without practicing much, somehow I managed to get second place, and I won some money, and it was weird because I didn't think of you know earning money or you know being rewarded for not really. Preparing for a very long time, and this is not something that anyone out there should do. <laughs> if you're going to prepare for something, please practice, properly. practice, uh, yes, practice when you practice do competitions. Daily. Okay, <laughs> if you um, if you but, if you want to talk about uh, if you want to listen to uh, competition preparation, uh, go to the first episode of the Violin Podcast where I interview Gaia Costner. That's a good example of how she um, prepares for competition. So, how did you prepare for the Menuhin competition? I was juggling with a lot of schoolwork at that time, and I just tried to practice as much as I could. Um, I I think my research supervisor noticed that I stopped coming into the lab as regularly as I ah. used to, or as I should have. Um, but there was a, you know, there was a period of time in the month before where, in addition to exams and assignments and you know everything at school, that I practiced and I tried really hard um, and I had Lin Cheng's guidance but you know of course when you're not studying music and living it you know as a as a uh, full-time uh, you know working in that kind of environment your focus is divided and I felt that it was just it was just to see how I would do. I just threw in, you know, my line and just see like where it would take me. Um, and so I, I didn't do very well in that competition. I I went and played in the quarterfinals um, and then I was promptly eliminated, um, which was fine because I had a lot of schoolwork to get back to anyway. Um, and I was, you know, preparing Barbara Concerto for that competition. And I think, um, a week and a half later, that was when the concert was for the youth orchestra. And it was really great, you know, to still be able to play the concerto. Um, you know, I don't remember very much what happened on stage. I think the mentality at the time, if I have to guess, I was probably praying for it to be over. <laughs> because, you know, the stress just doesn't feel good and you know stage fright is not a good feeling and you just want to get it over with but yeah sometimes for me when, uh, for me I, f I get this really queasy feeling in my gut and i'm sure yeah. people listening and watching can relate it's just like there's like it's like yeah. a it's it's like a, like a tight unsettled. ball like rolling around in your gut that that's the feeling for me yeah sometimes. for me i can't eat before i play um i my hands get sweaty uh, my bow doesn't shake, although I do tense up quite a bit. And so, you know, you just figure out with each performance what your habits are, you reflect, and and, and then you take a lesson from it. But I, I don't go back and think on performances like, oh, I wish I did something better, or like, oh, you know, it, it was sort of like in the moment I am there, and then afterwards, you know, life continues and I you know I think we all strive to do the best we can and then we look for the next opportunity and we 
do the best we can to prepare for that. So I don't know if that really answers your question. I don't remember. No, it was much. it was more it was more of an open ended question because everybody deals with um, stress on stage differently. I know that for me, you know, my what works for me might be different than what will work for you, and will my work for you might be different than the person listening or watching to this podcast. So. Um, for sure, for more sure. of an open-ended question, so I appreciate your thoughts on that. And since you moved to New York, Max, I want to touch base on what you've been doing in New York. So you've been you've been at Julia for a few years now. You've been performing, and you're 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 in this music bubble right now, as as yeah. as I'm as you, as you've spoken earlier now. Talk about the music scene in New York and what it's like collaborating with other New York musicians. Um, well, it's great. Everything here is really, uh, it, it's, there are so many musicians here. I'll put it this way. There are so many musicians here. Everyone gets to know everyone else. If not by word of mouth, then, you know, in passing, you know, you meet and you make acquaintances and through a friend of a friend of a friend, probably you could cover, yeah hundreds and hundreds of people. I mean, there are so many music schools in New York. You have Juilliard, you have um, the Manhattan School of Music, you also have Manus, uh, you have, um, uh, there's a music, the doctoral program at CUNY, um, you know, the Copeland School in Queens. Um, there's so many musicians, so many mu music students too. Um, and you just, make a lot of friends and by word of mouth, you know, if someone needs you for a gig, for a concert, for some opportunity, um, it's very easy to build a network, I find, more than other communities that might be more spread out. One of the challenges is, is that New York being such a densely populated city, and of course, you know, known for being a cultural hub and having so much going on, it tends to make it difficult for people to support each other in a way. One of the things that I noticed at school, and maybe it's actually true at every music school, you can tell me if it's accurate or not, but I think most students don't go to each other's recitals. Most musicians rarely have the time to go to each other's performances. I think either because we're all too busy um, with our own or we're trying to find time to practice because there's so much going on and so much to prepare for. Um, so at Juilliard, what's been really wonderful is that, you know, of course there are several hundred people at school, um, but I think through the orchestra cycles, through chamber music, um, through your own teacher studios, uh, you get to find your own niche, maybe your own close circle of friends, and then you support each other within that, which is really great. And I think I have some really great friends here um, and people who I really trust and feel like I could go to for advice. And if I ever need someone to help me out with an opportunity or with an event, or if they if I need someone to substitute for teaching or something, or if I need to substitute for a friend, I, I always feel like it's possible to, um, to find people who care and support and want to just help other people understand why we love music so much. So I think New York is a really exciting place to be. So I think what to you're trying to, right. I think yeah. what you're trying to say is um, there's, there's, there's that camaraderie as well. Yeah. yeah it seems like the, what you're saying when like, Hey, you know, I, I can't, I can't teach this day. Can you, can you sub for me? I think there's just that, that mutual respect amongst musicians, which I find that this, the violin community around the entire world has, which is why it's such a unique community. Because even in uh, in episode two, I encourage listeners to uh, listen at the Violin Guild, which is run by Dr. Abraham. He That Facebook group is made out of all string players, and it's a 35,000 member group. And everybody oh, just gets amazing. to share tips and there are new members joining in who are looking for teachers online and are just trying to figure out how to play violin and there's this amazing community and i know for myself that there's uh i have so much respect for my colleagues um you know in the boston area and massachusetts and new england in general where i am uh you know sometimes their their life gets incredibly busy where i'm like 
I have no choice but to ask for a sub. And the fact that they will agree to sub is already such an amazing thing. I want to point out what was something that you said about attending recitals and attending concerts and performances. You know, for me, I struggle with this because I am a working musician and sometimes it's so difficult to attend a, a, a friend's performance just because, you know, I have my own concerts that are scheduled that I have to practice for. So can you talk about the, the audience experience for a non-musician who might be listening to this violin podcast um, and what your thoughts sure. are on that? Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you something that my, my mother said to me um, a couple years ago. Um, and I don't, my parents don't often come to concerts because, you know, if, if I'm playing somewhere far away, it just makes no sense. <laughs> but um, one thing that they, that my mother said to me was that, um, was that, you know, you should really go support your friends, like go see like what other people are doing because if, if you don't take interest in supporting others, like by going to events, like why would you expect other people to do that for you? And I thought that to be, I'd never thought of it that way, but you know, my mother being not a musician, um, I think there's a lot of idea that like what you do is what you get. And so when you invest in a community, then I think you can expect other people to trust you and to count on you and I think you inspire other people to do the same um, and it's actually something that I find very um, uh, inherent in both of my current teachers so I study with Donald Wallerstein who many of you know him as the one of the founders and the violinist of the Cleveland String Quartet um, he teaches at New England Conservatory and he has a small studio at Juilliard um, and my other teacher Catherine Cho um, has been very, very structured and organized in the way that she um, builds her studio as a community. Uh, and I think it's so important to have people that you can count on because, you know, when we perform or when we practice and we sort of prepare for things, we're so in our own world, we're alone in this solitary practice room. And it's a very reflective process, you know, it's just you, you with yourself. Uh, and I think to have that network of friends um, around you is is really important psychologically and also musically, you know, for our craft. So when I go to concerts, one of the things that I used to, the way I used to listen, I think, was um, whether this person played the piece that I know the way I think it should go. And then I realized that actually, you know, then I would be frustrated all the time because everyone is different. Uh, and what's interesting about what someone does um, is, is that they maybe discovered something interesting about the piece and they have something to say about it. And I find that to be the most difficult thing to understand what makes all of us different in the way we perform and the, the way we understand the musical text. Um, and then I started finding myself listening more so to people playing live nowadays. I don't listen very much to recordings, actually. I find it very frustrating, but particularly like modern recordings. Um, I've stopped listening um, for the most part, um, with the exception of maybe orchestral recordings, choral recordings, things that I can't experience um, through a small venue or with friends. Um, and I start listening more for whether that person is really connected with their music and that kind of sincerity and that kind of connection, I think is what gives me goosebumps and really inspires me to find something better about my own playing and my own search for the truth in the musical score. And, and so that's my perspective as an audience member, because I think the kind of energy you, you reciprocate when you applaud or when you cheer on a friend or a complete stranger, I think it really validates the value of what they have to offer and then you want them to do better. And then in turn, I feel like they inspire me to do better as well. So that's my perspective. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I want to transition the conversation into practicing. Because someone who, can, comes across, uh, someone who comes across this podcast 
might not know, you know, different practice strategies or practice techniques. And I just want you to maybe say a few words as to what your approach is when it comes to practicing. How long do you practice these days? Um, what do you practice and how do you practice it? Um, well, I would just, I'm not going to tell you how much I practice nowadays. Because <laughs> yeah, it's maybe rather that, embarrassing. Maybe it will either be, be a very low number or very high number. That could be for another time. Yeah. Um, I, so the way I practice was very much influenced by one of my first major violin teachers, someone who, you know, I studied with Albert Markov, um, who is a really phenomenal performer, but he's also this incredible composer. Uh, and I remember if I had to choose like two big takeaways from what he taught me, the first was not to take anything for granted. Um, and the second thing was uh, sort of being very structured in how you approach new music. So he used to make all his students memorize music visually. So you would look at the score, you would divide the piece up into segments and you would sort of analyze the structure of the piece in that way subconsciously. I, as a nine, 10 year old, I didn't understand that, but you know, I did it. And now it sort of has become inherent in how I look at music. Um, and he encouraged us, well, he ordered us in a way, uh, to study the score and memorize things visually. And then we'd have to play things from memory, the lesson afterwards or the second lesson afterwards. And um, and sometimes, you know, you would memorize without the instrument and then just be expected to at least be able to play through without having practiced. And I think that was a very interesting training in terms of how I practice because I think when you know what you want, then the technique that you practice through scales, through etudes, those are things in your toolbox. This is a wonderful analogy that um, I think was codified to me <laughs> by Miriam Fried, who also teaches at New England Conservatory. She also runs the um, the strings uh, chamber the chamber music program at Ravinia Festival. Um, she said, you know, like when we practice technique, it's like you have tools in your toolbox. And in the music we play, when you see a certain passage and you know how what the challenges are, um, then you know what technique or how to fix that challenge or that problem with the tools in your toolbox. And that's the technique that you you practice. So I think in my practicing, I definitely try to maintain um, consistency with scales, with sound production, shifting, flexibility, connection between both the left and right side of the body, um, the hands, the arms, um, and how that relates to breathing. And of course, breathing definitely relates to how you stand and your overall posture. Um, and so I think that's one aspect. The other aspect is I think what brings me a lot of interest and excitement is really studying a score and all of the context around it, the historical context, the performance practice, the styles, maybe who was interested, um, uh, which composers were interested in which performers, maybe they were influenced by someone's playing. Um, recently, I came across this article in this music journal that um, Beethoven was very much influenced when writing the Kreutzer Sonata and the last sonata by um, the violin professors at the Paris Conservatoire. And we think of Beethoven as this, you know, he is the German composer who revolutionized classical music in so many ways. But to think that, you know, he was very much influenced by French style violin playing is not something that is commonplace. I don't think many people are aware, or maybe I'm just really ignorant, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's something quite interesting to know about these things when you study a score. And then when you approach it, I think you take all those factors into consideration and you develop your own interpretation. So when I practice, this is sort of the things that inspire me. And I try to be um, as diligent in my study of the score. And then when I practice, um, it's a common use to tell everyone at, at the summer camp, practice slowly. Always practice slowly, slowly first. It's like 80% of the time you should really do very, very slow practice and pay attention to everything. And that's something that's also stayed with me. You mentioned the word inspire. 
and inspiration many times. Um, how important it is to be inspired while you practice? I think it's immensely important. Um, I think, you know, when we perform, I don't think we go to concerts or we listen to recordings because we want to hear something perfectly executed. I think that's a rather ambiguous uh, way of putting things. I think we want to be touched. I think we want to be moved. I think we want to feel like we experience something very special. Um, and maybe that's a old fashioned conservative approach to music and digesting music and um, performing. But I think there's uh, something very important about being finding joy in all of the things that you do. Because if not, I think if we do something that we don't like and you say, okay, well, I'm studying the violin, I'm taking violin lessons, I am going to practice three hours today and I'm going to practice three hours tomorrow only because I have to be prepared for my next lesson. Well, I think if it doesn't interest you, then it's really not a good use of your time. I think if we feel joy and excitement about the things that we discover in our practicing, then I think we self-motivate ourselves to do better. And I think that's what we strive to do, is to do better so that we can better communicate the musical truth in these pieces that we program, whether it's old music or new music. Um, and, and then I think the listener who is paying to either listen to a live stream or to a recording or in an actual concert hall or you know some live venue, then they're getting their money's worth. They should, I have a very firm belief that audience members should not come to a concert with the expectation that they are just there to relax. I think they are there to be in a very provocative experience. If it's very beautiful music and they find it soothing and they're moved by it, I think that's also great. But I don't think the point of us as classical musicians who play this wonderful music by Beethoven and and Mahler and Schumann, Brahms, you know, the standards, and of course by other lesser known composers or even contemporary composers, I don't think you go into those kinds of experiences saying, I'm going to go there to take a nap. I then might as well take a nap at home and then you don't have to spend any money. But I think what we give in terms of value um, is really that being able to move somebody. And I think that is really the process of inspiring someone. If we don't feel the inspiration, I don't think other people will feel it. Most often I think, I, I've had this experience many times in lessons where I feel something and I think I'm doing it. And then the teacher tells me, I don't, like, they'll ask, like, what are you trying to do? And then they'll say, like, I don't hear it. Exactly. Yeah, I, I get that all. I get that all the time. Like, you, you're not doing what's on the page. Well, and then I'm like, yeah, well, I, I thought I was doing it. It's like, but yeah, and it's because because clear. reality yeah. and perception are two different things. Right. Yeah. So as performers, we actually have to amplify it 10 or 20 times. So the audience member could get that one percent in you know yes or or it could be like what i've become interested in as part of my dma studies now is that actually understanding the psychology of the listener is really important so i'm reading this um i i have this interest in historical recordings and um why it is that in these pre-1940s recordings you can listen to any violinist and just by the sound or the way of playing, you know exactly who that is. And you can, even if you don't know who it is, you can listen to three different recordings, two different recordings, and you know that they're different people. But nowadays you listen to maybe 10 people playing the same piece. For example, at a competition, you listen to 50, 70 people play the exact same repertoire. You can't tell the difference between most of them probably. I think it's harder and harder to tell the difference. I think people are starting to recognize that the individuality needs to be communicated and that there isn't one way to play a piece. I'm not saying that most people who go to competitions, I'm not saying at all that people play the same, but I do think that when people do play the same pieces and there is this um, system in competitions or you know auditions where certain interpretations are celebrated and others are maybe discarded from an earlier round, you lose some of the individuality. And I think it reinforces a sense that, oh, 
if I listen to this famous person play this way, then something is working. So I need to incorporate some of that into the way I play. I think that's not so right, actually. And so one of the things that interests me, I came across this essay, um, which is part of a book. I'll just say it's a book on music phenomenology. It's called Music in Time. And it's a collection of essays written by musicologists, which is around you know how to listen to historical recordings or interpretation. And one of the uh, quotations, I think, was from uh, writing by Schenker and basically said that, you know, performers, we adhere so much to practicing with the metronome. And actually, when you perform metronomically, like if you play steadily with a metronome to the performer, it feels like we're playing steadily and in time. But to the listener, actually, it sounds like the performer is rushing. But if the performer plays like they, are, they feel like they're slowing down or they're taking some time to the listener, it sounds like they're playing in time. And the fact that a performer has to play out of time in order to sound in time is rather paradoxical. But it's the psychology of in music, when we listen to something, we don't understand what we just listened to until it's concluded. So when we hear a phrase, when we hear a sentence or you know whatever musical structure, we don't understand what it is until afterwards in its entirety. And so that minute millisecond or two milliseconds is all the listener needs to understand what they just heard and process it. And of course the music keeps going, but if the performer just rushes on to the next thing, then it feels almost like a run on sentence and it feels like things are compressed and there isn't really time to digest what we just heard. Then it becomes incomprehensible. Um, and so it's interesting, the fact that performers now, maybe in our studies with the metronome, we feel this obsession to play in time, whereas in the past, performers played in a time in which certain gestures, certain expressive elements, you know, a phrase or a slide or an interval, the way some singer might sing a phrase, that took a specific amount of time. And then it doesn't matter where the pulse is, the pulse can be flexible. One doesn't play all music this way, of course, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about. And I think this is a conversation that is to be continued. I think this is an ongoing conversation for everyone. I think oh, um, I definitely, I fall into the trap when I practice that I need to be, especially for orchestra auditions. I find that people who are doing orchestra auditions professionally or doing extra for a college audition, they fall into the trap where like orchestra excerpts need to be perfect. They need to be good articulation, good metron like steady metronome, Schumann Scherzo, uh, you know, symphony number two is a perfect example of that. And sometimes we fall into the trap. And um, I guess what you're trying to say is what you're suggesting is that there's a flexibility in the time. And especially with the with the perception and the reality conversation. And just want to say thank you so much for sharing all of that and your expertise and your thoughts on all of that. So before we end the interview, so far, every guest gets to play violin podcast trivia. So the so for anyone who's watching on our YouTube channel, first of all, welcome. And uh, the, the guest gets to answer five questions in 25 seconds time. And you need oh, to gosh. get three out of the five questions right to get a prize from me. All right. Okay. okay. So well, I have to say just up front, my trivia is not that great. So please don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> well, of, of course not. So we have uh, we have 25 seconds on the clock here. And I have my um, actually have all my trivia questions right over here. Okay. So here we go. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Three, two, one, go. Who was Antonio Stradivari's teacher? God, I don't know that. This is embarrassing. You can say pass. Pass. <laughs> Which 19th century violinist was known as the king of the violin? Oh my god. <laughs> you can pass. Viotti. Okay, um, who premiered Brahms' violin concerto? Joachim. How many calories does a violinist burn in one hour of playing? Isn't that really variable? <laughs> I think I burned a leaf. I'm going to pass. I have no clue. Before steel <laughs> strings were a thing, what were violin strings made out of? Guts. Okay. 
that was really embarrassing. <laughs> Goodness me. Um, now I have to go look up all of that. You know, maybe I'll, I'll have to know those answers for DMA. So, all right. So let's, let's review. So the first question was, who was Antonio Stradivari's teacher? The answer to that is Amati. Nicolo Amati yeah. was Stradivari's teacher from Cremona. And uh, for anyone who's listening for the first time, uh, Nicolo Amati and uh, Stradivari were, um, you know, Amati was a mentor of Stradivari. So, so Stradivari learned how to make the violin from him in Cremona, Italy, back around, you know, 350 to 400 years ago. All right. So the next question, which 19th century violinist was known as the king of the violin. He was referred to as the king of the violin. Do you have a oh, guess now? I feel like Paganini. I am so bad with this. He was the first one alongside Franz Liszt to make the rock star image of the violin. But it was good. Eugene Izai who was the king oh, of the violin. Which century are we talking about? <laughs> Late 19th century. <laughs> Oh gosh! Late nineteenth century, early twentieth century. Of course, uh, this is so sad that I don't know. <laughs> okay, and I'm uh, crying on the inside. Eric, <laughs> this is really question bad. three: Who premiered Brahms' Violin Concerto? Joseph Joachim. You got that right. Um, how many calories does the violinist burn in one hour of playing? So, actually, one hundred and seventy-five calories in really? one hour. Yeah. Oh. Well, so much for the thought that practicing equates to working out. <laughs> yes, people, practicing the violin is a fitness routine, is a fitness regimen, so go practice. And question five, before steel strings, what were violin strings made out of? You said gut. Gut was correct. So you got two out of the five questions, right? Oh, this is so sad. So <laughs> you know. Anything else. <laughs> so no mug from me. So I apologize about that. But Max, uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts on the Violin Podcast. I really, really appreciate your, your insight on the world, on music. And, and I hope that uh, in the future that we get to reconnect and have you on the Violin Podcast once more, hopefully in person. Oh, well, that would be very, very fun. That would be a lot of fun. Well, okay. Well, this has been another episode of the Violin Podcast with Max Tan. And if you liked what you've heard and if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe and click the bell notifications so that way you get updated um, when episodes come out. So, Max, we'll see you next time. Okay, thanks, Eric.